All right, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 13. I'm just going to use this as a springboard verse. There's so many other verses that I could use, you know, to, to get this started, because we're going to have a lot of verses tonight going everywhere, okay? But I, I, I guess I, I want to preface this by being very clear about some things. Uh, I, I think that we need to, in these times, well, let's pray first. Father, Lord, I pray you be with us now. God, we need you so badly. Lord, people need to understand the truths of these matters, Lord, and not be uh, swayed by uh, the phoniness that's out there, Lord, the, the fakes that are out there, the, those that are trying to deceive people. And, Lord, I pray that your word would be clear tonight. I pray that what I say would be clear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Here we go. Now, Genesis chapter 13, verse number 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You know, in all of this, we're going to talk about Orlando, the Orlando nightclub attack. I call this the sodomization of a nation, yeah. right? And Stephen Anderson's Islamic theology, because it all kind of just goes, I know it's just crazy, isn't it? But it all kind of just goes together because that's what it is. It's just a big mess is what it is. It's, it's an absolutely huge mess, you know, that's going on right now in our world. And I think it's important that people understand what is going on in our world today. I think it's important for God's people to understand what's going on in our world today so they, ha that they can figure it out. Um, this, what, what took place, this attack that took place... Um, some call it a false flag. Some call it a, um, what's it, a hoax. I, I, I really believe people died. I really believe people died. But I also believe that it, it was a, I also believe that there's a lot of evidence that leads us to believe that there were some interesting characters involved with this that weren't just random, they were not just random Muslims that were just walking around saying, hey, I think I'll go blow up the nightclub tonight. You know, I think I'll just go kill everybody. I mean, for instance, I mean, I think it's important to understand that, like, this man that did this, he didn't, he worked for one of the highest level security, the, the, the biggest security companies uh, in the country, in the world, in the world, security firms. Well, those guys don't at all go crazy, do they? Um, so, you know, he, he was working with the government. The FBI was watching him. Don't be surprised if this doesn't get cut off. But, <laughs> but I mean, the, the FBI, they were, they were watching him. So they knew exactly, you know, what they were dealing with. You know, so, and I mean, let's face it, we, we all understand, and if, you, if you've been around technology long enough to know, they can seriously hear a bat poop in the woods like 100 miles away. I mean, they can hear that. They can literally hear, they can, they can literally like hear that. I know it's funny, but it's true. They really can. Like, you don't hide from these people unless they want you to. Anyway, so that's another story. So there are, there are a lot of interesting things. I mean, videos that first came out, there's evidence of all this stuff. I, I'm not getting into conspiracy really that much tonight because I don't think it is a conspiracy. I think it's pretty plain. But um, uh, there were actually testimonies, live video testimonies of people that said, or I mean, after the, the event happened, that they, would, they said, hey, listen, there's, um, there's uh, somebody was holding the door closed so people couldn't get out. And there was more than one testimony of that. More than one. Video talking about that. And that's all the local stations do that. And then all of a sudden, two or three days down the road, it all disappears and you can't find that information out. But that's just spooky people that believe in conspiracies. No, it's actually people that were there that said, hey, this is what happened. So do I believe people died? Absolutely. I think people died. Do I think it was how they say it is? No, it's never how they say it is. Right? It isn't ever how they say it is. And if you ever believe it is, then I got two words for you, building seven. That's it. I'm not even going to say the other magical words that people like to say. Every 9-11, I'm not going to say those words. I will just say building seven. And all you have to do is look at that and say, well, that's absolutely impossible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, but you have to be a really doped up and foolish and stupid nation to believe it. And we are. Okay? We are. So, you know, I, I, I preface it by saying some of those things, I'm not, that's not the concentration, that's not what I'm focusing on tonight, but it is important to understand that I don't think this is going to be the last attack like that. We already seen something in Amarillo, Texas went down. Um, there's, there's a... 
there's a motive behind all of this, okay? And there's a, there's a bunch of players in this game. There's a bunch of opportunists in this game that have a lot to gain by this going through the way it is. And I think most people don't really understand how this, how this works out, it, how this affects the whole plan of the New World Order, how this really affects it. They don't understand it. They don't want to believe it. Let's not talk about it. Come on, what's church have to do with the New World Order? I mean, a lot. What do you think, what kingdom do you think is coming? Do you think it's, what kingdom do you think is coming to take over the whole earth? What is that? Right? Yeah, exactly. What, it, what is it? It's the Antichrist, right? And Glenn Beck is bringing them on. All these guys are bringing them on. Hey, bring on the Antichrist. Bring on the Antichrist. Bring on the end. That's what this is about. So, yes, this is a spiritual matter. It absolutely is what takes place because there's a reason they are doing all this. Somebody said my voice is nasally. I don't think I sound nasally. Brother Andrew, what are you doing to me over there anyway? Uh, blame it on YouTube. It's probably, it's probably because I said all those, those I, I said all those key words probably. And now they're, now they're scrambling me up here anyway. But I, I've got this recorded right here. Is it? All right. Uh, no, I'm going to keep going. I mean, you do what you need to do over there. If you need to, go ahead. As long as you don't don't uh, change. <laughs> hey, now that's an insult. <laughs> anyway, as long as we don't change what we're doing here, that's all that matters to me at this time. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, I've been through this before. I've had this stuff happen to me before. So I'm going to go ahead and have a backup recorder. I'm going to record it on this too, just because I've had it happen a few times. All right, there we go. Okay, so we're going to keep going here. Uh, the issue is a biblical issue, all right, and it's important to deal with. Why? Because there are so many people perverting the scriptures, and they have absolutely impure motives for all of this. They're misrepresenting the Word of God and the proper biblical position that you and I should have in issues like this. Opportunists abound when a situation like this arises. Like what did uh, Rahm Emanuel say? He said, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. Right? I mean, that's what he said. And look what happens when a, when, a Chicago, when a gangster takes over Chicago. Like last weekend, 35 people died. You didn't know that, though, did you? No, you just knew about the 50 people in the nightclub. And nobody talks about the 4,000 babies a day. Why? Because there's an agenda. There's an agenda. All right, so... So I'm going to go through the opportunists here, and then I'm going to give you a bunch of scripture why they're wrong and wicked, and um, we'll keep going. And hopefully, I explain these things to you. Number one, the government sees this as an opportunity. Our government sees this as an opportunity. The first opportunist is, is the government in all this. The president, he desires to use an attack possible to take away the guns from law-abiding citizens. That's his, that's his goal, is to push for the, the Second Amendment to be destroyed. Did you see now Homeland Security came out today? It just proves, you, proves me right. That's why I love it. I love it to be proved right with their own words. Home, the, the director of Homeland Security came out today, and you know what he said? He said, Gun, the right to keep and to bear arms has now become a, a Homeland Security issue. Now, what does he mean by that? He means that he can use executive order, the Patriot Act, and everything else to try to take guns away from... Because, you know, I mean, I, I notice when I walk down the street a lot and in the newspaper and online, I see a lot of white American Christians running around with big Uzis and guns and, and shooting every place up. You, you see that a lot, right? Right? You see a lot of black Christians running around shooting people up, right? You see it all the time, right? Yeah, it just happens every day. I mean, it's just like, it's those Christians and their guns. That's what it is. We got to get that. It's those, it's those Republicans. You know, seriously, there hasn't been one yet, which I'm not a Republican, but there hasn't been one yet so far that has really been a part of that. Usually it's been a Democrat, a crazy liberal Democrat that's connected to the military somehow. That's just the truth of the matter. That's just the way, that's not comfortable to say, but that's just the absolute truth. When's the last time you saw a Christian man take off and start murdering everyone in sight? You haven't. So, and also, listen, please don't lump Roman Catholics and the Crusades in with Christians. 
Roman Catholics are not Christians. I love the Roman Catholic people. Want them to be saved. They're lost. I, I'm not. I'm not angry with Roman Catholic people. All right. I'm angry with the papacy. I'm angry with the, with the Vatican. I'm angry with Rome because they're a bunch of phonies. They're a bunch of devil possessed, wicked people. Okay, ran by the Antichrist. They are Antichrist at the core. But the Catholic people need to be saved. All right. So I, I I'm not I'm not being unkind to them at all. But I'm telling you that their leaders are wicked and corrupt, just like the leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention are. But Roman Catholics are not Christians, and real Christians had nothing to do with the Pope's crusades. Why is it that the government wishes to get the guns from law-abiding citizens, law-abiding Christians in America? I'll tell you why. Because they're the only ones that would defend the Republic against absolute tyranny. Rape and murder and pillage of the, that the federal government would do to its own citizens. But that's treasonous to say something like that. No, it's not. Your founding fathers said it. All of them said it. That was their greatest fear. That's why they made sure there was a Second Amendment, to recognize those rights. Because they knew what was, they knew, they know why. Because they just came from a government that took their weapons, kicked their door in. So, uh, what, what do you call that when they, when they take the house? Um, I forget what that's called. They kick the door in, they, the soldiers come in and, and uh, commandeer that. Yeah, quarter of the house, that's right. That's it, yep, and they take the house. That's what they were used to. So they made it, so they, so they had a bill of rights that recognized God-given rights. that You're not allowed to just kick somebody's door in and do that. Amen. But you are now with the Patriot Act yeah, yeah. and other things. Yeah. Right? right? What's the Bible say about that? It's in, in, in Psalm chapter 82, turn there, Psalm chapter 82, verse number 3. I want, to, I want you to see this here. Because now, now there's preachers that I can't even believe it. Now they, they're out there preaching pass, passivity now. I mean, don't defend your family. They say, oh, you can't defend your family. You just let, so are you telling me you just let people walk in and rape your wife and kill your kids and everything else and you don't defend them? Boy, I'd feel real comfortable in that house. That's where I want to live. Right? No, not at all. Psalms 82, verse number 3, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Uh-oh. Oh, no, 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 I can't. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Here's the poor and the needy, right? Somebody that's being taken and, and they're being destroyed, molested, or whatever the case may be. But no, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Because Jesus doesn't want me to. He said to turn the other cheek. We're going to talk about self-defense soon down the road. But it's just ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. Turn to Exodus chapter 22. Verse number two, the government today would have you, no, no, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You should just wait for help. You mean three hours in a nightclub? Well, that's just weird. I mean, if I do something wrong, the cops are there in three seconds. Three hours? Three hours? If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, if, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. What's this talking about? Well, a thief comes in, breaks into your house. This is a law of God, by the way. This is a moral law. This is not a ceremonial law. Do you understand that? This is not ceremonial, okay? This is a moral law. This is the right of personal and private property to protect what is yours. It's God's way of protecting our own. But this government wants to take guns away from Christians. Why? Well, we can't have them having guns because then they could actually defend themselves in case we want to just do whatever we want to do to them. Right? We can't do whatever we want to do to them. You know, we couldn't. It would, it would even be harder to enact martial law and other things when everybody is armed. Yep. Right? It would be a little harder. It would be a little difficult. Yep. Are you saying the president doesn't understand that? Come on, he understands it full well. Yep. Absolutely he understands it. 
Don't you know that he would have done a hundred times more than what he's already done if he thought he could get away with it? Absolutely. Yeah, he probably would have Sharia law if he had a chance to get it enacted. Of course, those guys at the high level, you have to understand, they're just Luciferians. They all serve Satan. They don't really care about religious creeds or anything like that. They just serve the devil. Satan is their father, and they bow down and lick his hoofs. That's what they do. Now, you can't be a successful dictator or bring in a new world order without first stripping Christians of their guns. You have to demonize the Christians in America so badly to show that they're the real problem. You know, did you know that 11 countries are ran by Islamic dictators that put to death homosexuals right away upon finding them? Now, why isn't the president talking about ending Islam in America then? Now, I'm not for doing that, by the way, because I understand that people have the right to believe what they, what they want to. That's a God-given right. It's called, you do have a right to be wrong, and you have a right to go to hell. You do. Okay, so you have a right to do that. You have a right to go to hell, and nobody can stop you. Amen. We could try to impede you. We could try to tell you the truth. We could try to stop it. But you have the right to go to hell. If you want to go to hell, you have the right to do that. You want to believe in a false god, you have the right to do that. God gave you that. He said, okay, you know what? You can believe in me. If you don't, you're going to go to hell. Right? You say, what about freedom of religion? Well, we have that. We have a Second Amendment for the same amount. We've had the Second Amendment, though, for the same amount of time as we had the First Amendment. But you know what? It seems like to me that... They never try to attack the First Amendment as much as they do the Second Amendment. Why? Well, because without a Second Amendment, the First Amendment don't do you any good. Because try standing in front of a tank, uh, tank and telling it without any weapons and telling them you have free speech. Right? Right, exactly. Now stand, now stand in a home with all kinds of weapons and everything else when they come rolling through, and that's a different story. You can say a whole lot of things when you're standing with an AK-47 in your hand. A lot more than you can without it. I'm not advocating that. I'm just telling you that's the truth. All right, is this too practical? I hope it is. The con okay, now I want to read you some, uh, some of the Founding Fathers' remarks about this, then we'll get into this. The Constitution of most of our states and of the United States assert that all power is inherent in the people, that they may exercise it by themselves, that is their right and duty to be at all times armed. It's their duty. Thomas Jefferson said that. Letter to John Cartwright, June 5th, 1824. Before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed, as they are in almost every country in Europe. The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword, because the whole body of the people are armed and, a constitu and constitute a force superior to any band of regular troops. Noah Webster an examination of the leading principles of the federal constitution, October 10th, 1787. James Madison, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people, trained to arms, is the best and most natural defense of a free country. How about Patrick Henry, the friend of the Baptists? Guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. No, don't do that. They all have your best interests in heart. I mean, they wouldn't create false flags attacks to take away your guns. They wouldn't do that to create enough hysteria so people would say, okay, fine, we'll just give it all up. Just protect us. They wouldn't do that. Now, would they? I don't know. Yeah, exactly, Rice Tag, that's right. Uh, but you know what? Patrick Henry thought they would. No, Patrick Henry knew they would. He said, guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Whenever you give up that force, you are ruined. The great object is that every man may be armed. That every man be armed. Everyone who is able might have a gun. Patrick Henry's speech, excuse me, speech to Virginia ratifying convention, June 5th, 1778. What is, what is going on here? The government is tri twisting a tragedy and using it, creating a problem and making up the solution, yep. right? Yep. So they can disarm the American people. Yep. That's what it's all about. 
That's one of the things. That's not all. that. There's more pieces to this, but that's one of them. So God says you should be able to defend yourself and take care of yourself. You should take care of yourself and defend yourself. The government wants to say, no, you need us to do it. You don't do so hot. You let 50 people die in a nightclub. I don't think you know what you're doing. Right? Yeah, I think some people should have had some weapons there. If that, was, that a no, was that a no gun zone? I wonder if that was. Most bars are, yeah. Well, I guess they know where to attack, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, those attacks take places where guns are not allowed. Schools and other places. They don't ever attack places that people are fully armed. When's the last time you saw an Islamic attack on a police station? When's the last time you seen an Islamic attack, a, a ISIS attack on a, on a gun show? When's the last time you seen Cabela's attacked? Yeah. Yeah, when's the last time you seen an attack on a redneck? Right, yeah. When did you see that, right? Huh? When do you see that? You don't, right? A fishing and hunting expo? No, right? Doesn't happen, does it? Why? Because they'll kill you, that's why. The answer is not to ban Islam. But they do want to ban all the guns. But guns didn't kill anybody. Crazy Islamic government operatives. Possibly. I say possibly. Might as well have been. Well, I mean, now, is this true? Somebody said that this young man's father actually ran for president. I've heard this in Afghanistan. I've heard some rumors like that. I don't know if that's true or not, but somebody said that in a video, in a, which people say things all the time. But, you know, that's, I don't have, you know, complete, you know, assurance that that's true. But, I mean, you know, there's, there's, um, there's definitely some major connections here to people in the government. I mean, it, it, uh, allegedly he visited Congress, this father, the, the father of this man that did this visited Congress. All I know is that everybody that ever get, every Muslim that ever gets attached to the government always wants to make something go boom. I don't know why, but they always do. Next, so that's, so that's one of the game plans is, right, let's strip the American people, let's build their rage, we'll get to the fomenting of rage, because they want to build rage up, there's a reason for that, okay? Number two, the LGBT group, they see this as a major opportunity, and they are riding high on this right now, believe me. They are pushing, this is a, this is a, a, a psyop in the sense of, okay, we want to make you feel bad for homosexuals. Well, I already feel bad for you. You're trapped and dead in trespasses and sins. You're going to die and go to hell in your filthy, disgusting, vile sin. I don't hate you. I want you to be saved. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Amen. Truth is you're going to die and go to a devil's hell. That's the truth. So I do feel bad for you for that. Absolutely. I don't want to see you die like that. Amen. But they want to use this to promote this movement. They want to push it. This whole month is LGBT month. This is Pride Month. Then you got Christians saying, oh, look at all. See, you died for your pride. And that's not the right. I mean, that's, I don't know that that's true. That's kind of foolish to say that is what it is. All right? But there's also another. Then you've got Stephen Anderson, which I'm going to get to his words and his little disciples' words, that little pipsqueak. Um, anyway, his words are what he said. But... You've also got other pastors out there that are, that are like doing videos and saying, I just want to apologize to the gay community. Well, can I help you with something? Okay, who in the world is the LGBT community? Is there like, is there like one person that represents the LGBT community? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's like when, when some white guy gets his arm cut off, I would like to apologize to the white people. Could you imagine how good that, how, how would that go over if I said that? How, how far would that go? I was like, well, I want to apologize to the black community. I, I hate that. It's stupid. It just sounds dumb. 
What is there like one federal head of all black people that you're apologizing to? Is there the council of the black? Is there the council of the white? Is there the council of the, of the homosexual that, you're, that represents all homosexuals across the world? And we're going to apologize to just that? It's stupid. It's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, how are you, how do you even do that? It doesn't even make sense. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, so, but that's what people are saying. There's, there's pastors out there saying things that, no, I don't, I don't have anything to apologize over because I didn't do anything. All right? I didn't do anything, so I'm not going to apologize to you for that. I do pray you get saved. I pray you leave your filthy, vile sin and get saved by the grace of God. That's not hate. That's the, that's the best love I could ever give you. So the president made his proclamation years ago, and now right in the middle of this Pride Month, we have to push tolerance, and everything is hate speech if you preach against it. That's one of the problems here. Here's another goal that we have here, and the, 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 that they have here. And what is that goal? That goal is to shut you up about homosexuality. Because now all the, all the uh, like he said, the political pundits, Hannity and, and Beck and all these other guys are, are, are saying, well, we just all need to come together as Americans. And... We just need to put aside all of our differences and just come together. I can't put aside my differences, okay? It's like saying I can put aside my differences with the drunk or the, or the, or the fornicator or anybody else. No, my, my differences, your differences are with God, and God's going to punish you. And you need to know the truth. And this nation is being destroyed because of this sodomite movement. It's like, it's like one of the death nails. It's like the last, it's one of the last uh, nails in the coffin, so to speak. In Genesis chapter 19, we see that God rained down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Turn there. Genesis chapter 19. You know, God had to pull Lot out of Sodom. Right? And the Lord reigned, verse number 24, Then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities, and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind and became a pillar of salt. What happened? God rained fire and brimstone down and destroyed them all. Now that's God's judgment. God did that. God didn't tell me to go rain fire and brimstone down on them. You understand the difference? I'm not God. All right? And neither is Stephen Anderson. Amen. Judges chapter 19, verse number 22, shows again the judgment of God upon this sin. Now as they were making their, their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. What did that cost? That, costed, that cost a lot. That cost the lives of all the men there. Because God wiped all that tribe of Benjamin out. They wiped all that group of people out. They were completely wiped out because of their sin. Because God hated it. God absolutely hates that sin. He absolutely hates. God hates sins of fornication. God hates those sins. He ab, I don't care if it's pornography, whatever it is, God hates it. And if you want the judgment of God upon a nation, upon your home, upon your life, you get into pornography and wicked bestiality and anything else like that and fornication and, and, and any of those things. And I'll tell you what, you bring the judgment of God down. You think you can play around with that stuff. You think God's just going to ignore you. You're crazy, friend. You're deceived and judgment is coming upon you. You better repent of that wicked garbage. God hates that sin. He absolutely hates it. It's blasphemy. It's wicked in his sight. It blasphemes every bit of order that God has set down. If you think you can run around and be a Christian pervert, you're nuts. You don't got a brain. You got rocks in your head thinking that. You're deceived by the devil. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You hear that? Amen. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's the answer to the LGBT question today, to the, to the community. You're not a community. You're a bunch of wicked sinners. You don't have a community. All right? You're part of the, you're part of the Antichrist kingdom. That's what part you are. You don't get a special little treatment and separate. The, no, you're wicked as hell. That's what you are. 
You need to repent. It's disgusting, and God hates it. Amen. That's just clear, and I don't hate you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Your daddy and your mommy will sit there and pat you and put some baby powder on you and think it's okay for you to act, for Tommy to act like he's, he's Tara, but it don't work that way, okay? God's going to judge you and cast you in the lake of fire for all of eternity. You better repent. That's the answer. Not, I, I, not I'm glad to see you burn in hell or anything like that. I'm not glad to see you die. I don't want to see anybody die like that. I, would, I don't wish hell on my worst enemy. It's awful. And I don't want to be the force to send somebody there either, you know, by taking their life. So I don't know why anybody would even think in their mind that that would be, that would be acceptable to even think that way. It's, it's wicked sin to even think that. You have murder in your heart. How you could take joy from something like that is disgusting. That's right. The Lord is very clear in the Old Testament and the New Testament that God has not changed. And if they don't repent, they'll perish along with other sinners listed above. We see Romans chapter 1 is the blueprint for that, for destroying any nation. And we're seeing the sodomization of a nation right now. This, this whole thing is being played off now, and they're going to push this whole, well, you know, this home is, I mean, the, the Governor Dayton lights up the, the bridge in a rainbow. I'm telling you, that guy's got to be gay. He just has to be. He just has to be. He has to be a sodomite. He just has to be. He did a Beyonce day too, yeah. Yep, I'm telling you, fruit city right there, fruit salad straight. I'm sorry, but that's exactly what that is. They're, they're just, they're just, it is just absolutely disgusting. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. It's a total takeover, and they want to use this as a psyop. You know, um, you have this psychotic man that the FBI was watching on more than one occasion, obviously. I, I, I'll get into that a little bit later. But anyway, this LGBT gang of gay thugs is going to use this to silence all opposition. And they are a bunch of thugs. They are. They're a sod mob, that's right. And they are. They absolutely are. And they will push their agenda, and they're pushing in the schools. Meanwhile, while they come out with this all pretty thing, they're going into schools, and they're pushing this LGBT transgender. So right here in Minnesota, Ann tried to threaten a preacher that wanted to go on the sidewalk and preach in front of them. told him he's gonna, they were going to have him arrested, and he was going to go to jail for that. Because they didn't want him to be there. They wanted to go ahead and teach Tommy how to be Tina without, stop it, without any opposition. Because they're a bunch of sick perverts, and that's just the truth. Like the Bible says, such as were some of you. Amen? Meanwhile, 35 people were murdered in Chicago over the last weekend. Where's the violence and anger for it? 4,000 babies butchered every day in America. But we need, a pro we need a protective class of people, and they can push their wicked lifestyle on us. And that's what they're going to use this for. Is that's what Obama wants to use it for. They want no rights for people that have no rights to speak against their evil, but every right to push and parade their evil actions. They want to use the arm of the law to silence Americans under the guise of hate. Oh, it's hate speech. I think they're confused about what hate really is. How is it hate to tell people the truth? How is it hate to have a dissenting view about something? Now today, if you have a dissenting view about something, it's automatically hate. If you don't go along with the collective, with the Borg, then, then you automatically have hate in your heart. Yep. Basically, it's hate to disagree with people because that's how the LGBT community views it. And that's when you can't have an honest discussion about all of this because all I have to say is if you disagree with me and tell me the truth, then you hate me. You don't have any love. That's what people do to shut you down on the street. You, Jesus is about love. He sure was. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he said. That's the love he was about. Right? 
The most loving thing I can do is tell you the truth. I'm an ambassador of Christ, and I have to warn you that no reconciliation with my king can be made until you lay down your rebellion against him and repent and believe on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way that you can have peace with my God. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace. We are ministers of reconciliation, but none can be had unless you meet the terms of reconciliation. And that's except you repent and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not hate. It's an act of mercy. That's the, Bible's re- that's the biblical response showing you that you are at enmity with God. And unless you repent, you will perish. I don't want to see what's coming upon you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Listen, we know the terror of the Lord, so we persuade men. That's why. We know what God's going to do. We know the judgment that's coming upon that LGBT community. We know what's coming. We absolutely do. But you know what? I know that my king is enacting the punishment on you that you justly deserved. And I'm trying to warn you, the homosexuals, to flee from that wrath to come because it's coming, friend. And when he comes, he will come with fiery indignation, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care who lights up a a, a bridge for you. God's going to light you up in hell. But they will attempt to shut us up, not let you speak against their sin. Why? That's part of the agenda. It's being used as silence. Well, if you say anything, then you hate, and we're going to watch you haters. We're going to put you on a list to make sure you, you're, we know what you're saying. It's being used to silence true godly, biblical, and peaceful preaching against their sin. That's what this event is going to be used for. It's being used for it already. Listen to me. This nation is over if we stop from preaching on sin. It's over. It's done. It's the last line of defense. The complete downfall will take place when the prophets of God are shut up in any nation. Full judgment is enacted and comes. It is not withheld. And that's where we're headed right now. They want to use all these attacks and all these special classes and all these hate speeches to shut you up. And when they shut preachers up or they do their best to shut them up, then that's when judgment is coming. Yeah, it's done. It'll be done. There won't be anything left. But the LGBT, they're going to run their psyop here to try to silence all opposition. It's a satanic plan to end any open opposition to sin. They want to shame. You know, they talk about shaming. No, they want to shame Christians back in the corner. They want to shame the Christians in the closet they came out of. They want to stand bold and naked in front of everybody running around like a bunch of perverts, but they want you to go in the closet and not tell anybody what you believe. Just keep it in the four walls there, and that's, and that's it. That's what they want, but we can't do that. We can't do that, not because it, you know what? It'd be more comfortable if we did. It'd be more comfortable if we, did if we just retreated, went inside, and let them all go to hell. That'd be more comfortable, but it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be biblical, and it wouldn't be loving our neighbor. And God wouldn't let us do it. That's right. Because we're called to be a light, and that light burns sometimes, and it shines a light. So you see this LGBT, this is, this, they're trying to rapidly speed this ahead and get the more evil that can come, the more devils come, the more, the more wickedness comes. That's the goal. That's the goal. The LGBT's goal in theirs is to run that psyop to say, well, you know what? If you say anything against us, well, then you automatically hate us, and you're glad we died in that attack. Right? Then in comes Stevie Boy Wonder Anderson here. Okay? That's the next thing. Anderson, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to call him that, the media whore, because that's what he is. Right. He is. He is the biggest prostitute that you could ever find in media. As soon as something happens, he's got to get in the limelight of it, and he's got to make himself known, and he's got to parade himself and play the part of the coadjutor, okay? And he's got to play the part of the antagonist and get in there right away and say something so so absolutely provocative and crazy. Why does he do that? So he can fit into the plan. I'm sorry, but that guy's a plant. I don't believe that guy's real at all. 
I absolutely believe that guy is working. Well, he's with Alex Jones, who's, who's now supporting Donald Trump fully, 100% on board with Donald Trump. How do you go from Ron Paul to Donald Trump? How do you even do that? And how do you have any credibility left when you do it? With people, how, do anybody, how does anybody take you seriously? But that's what's going on. Now, well, how does he play into this? Well, Anderson plays into this really well because he fits the narrative. They need a guy that comes out, and that guy's got to come out. What's he got to do? He's got to act like he hates everything. He's got to be Mr. Westboro and even double down worse than that and say all kinds of things about putting sodomites to death and executing them and glad their brains were blown out and everything else like that. He's got to say that so he can, so he can, take the, he can be the rabid fundamentalist in the picture. He's got to be that guy. they got to have one of those guys. So he's that guy. He's the guy that comes in and is a rabid, crazy, unreasonable fundamentalist that pretends to be what we actually are here, Bible believers, that actually stand for the book. No. I think he needs to read it. Yeah, I think he needs to read it too. So we have him and the ever-present Anderson, the opportunist that comes into, the, into play. The man who built his ministry on being tased at the border for being an absolute jerk. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't right. I'm saying, you know what? You can have a right stand and you can handle things the right way. Go listen, look at that video that I, that, with that cop that I, when I was dealing with that crazy cop down there, that crazy sheriff down there in Steele County. I didn't cuss him. I, or I didn't get mad at him. I didn't act like a belligerent fool with him. I mean, he's the one that acted belligerent many times over, right? Amen. But this man built his ministry on that, belligerent. He's a modern-day Alex Jones of, of media queen sensationalist. Yeah. That's exactly what he is. That does, he purposely does provocative things to draw attention to himself and to push his agenda, which is not a biblical agenda because it lacks the power thereof completely. But what is it? It's a game that he's part of the game. He's part of the chessboard. He's part of the piece of the puzzle. And that's what he's doing. And it's to be used against us. It's to stop us from being able to exercise, because some speech is just too dangerous to say. Right? Right? So some speech is just too dangerous, so we're going to have to do something about this First Amendment thing because some speech is just too dangerous. So we can't have guys going out there and saying what he said, right? Plus, and it's, it's there to make Christians look bad. He is part of that. I, I'll just say it. I mean, he has a Jesuit. I mean, he just reminds me of a Jesuit. He's working with the Jesuits. That's what reminds me. Well, Alex Jones, obviously we know. But anyway, um, I, I really believe that because nobody does the things that he does like he does, the way that he does, that he speaks out of both sides of his mouth, and he does like, he puts two different things, and I'm going to show you this in, in what I have here. Anyway, but Anderson's theology, I understand why Anderson's theology, why he says what he says, though. Because Anderson rejects biblical repentance. So if you don't believe it's possible for somebody to be saved, then you, should just, you, just, you want them to be put to death. Because you don't think there's any possibility for them to be saved. That's what he says. He doesn't believe that homosexuals can be saved. Why? Because he doesn't believe in repentance. I had some joker call me on the phone yesterday. They had me on the phone for an hour and 20 minutes, and I should have been really rude and hung up, but I didn't. Anyway, but he was on there, and he was trying to defend his position of no repentance. Anderson has to hold the theology of putting to death sodomites and wishing ill upon them or wishing death upon them. Why? Because he doesn't believe in the power of the gospel to change vile sinners and make them clean and new and white in the blood of the Lamb. He doesn't believe that. Listen, your, your theology, what you believe, affects your behavior. What you believe affects your behavior. He doesn't believe in a gospel that changes people. He doesn't believe the gospel can take a sodomite and see them repent and believe the gospel and that Jesus can make them new creatures. To him, they are nothing more than excess waste on the earth that need to be discarded. Now, I have a theory. I can't prove it, but I have a theory. 
I think anybody that goes after that the way that he does, with the anger and hatred he does, is a man that maybe had a bad experience with the sodomite. I'm not saying 100%. I know it's a theory. It's speculation. I said it's speculation. But anybody that comes that angry and that rabid and that wanting to kill, wanting to see them die. And he said his uncle was gay. And he talks about pedophilia a lot. But you know what? Repentance and repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ will take that anger and hate out of you. Amen. But when you don't believe in repentance, you can be healed of that, you know. Amen. But again, that's speculation. I'm not saying it 100%. I'm just saying that there's something that doesn't seem right with all that. Some, there's a lot of hate there. To him, uh, it's that, that, that's the type of hatred and spirit that he fosters, though. That type of hate. I've never seen a man hate something that bad unless they were victimized by something. Right? But he's trying to take the Bible and make it say things that he wants it to say so he can, so, so he can see filthy sodomites murdered. That's what he wants. To praise violence and murder of any life is wrong. It's wrong. It's wicked. They're not innocent. And people said, well, innocent people died. Well, no, nobody's. None of us are innocent. I mean, they are wicked, vile sinners. And we all deserve the judgment of God, every single one of us. But they were innocent in the sense that they didn't do anything to that person, probably. But Anderson comes from a, from a fundy background. He lived relatively clean in his life and was sheltered from a lot of sin and wickedness. And he's appalled that God would save, God could save somebody in the vilest of sins. I think he's appalled by that. He can't imagine that there are some that could be saved. To him, they are all reprobate and worthless and rid, and rid the world of them. Yeah, we know they're wicked and vile. God said they were. But his response and the response of his disciple pastor is not the biblical response. I'm going to read you what he said. It's a fleshly, hateful response, one that does not believe in the power to save lost sinners. So he must take the law into his own hands, or somebody else must, and force with the long arm of the law the change. He's doing the same thing the sods are doing. He's trying to shut down all opposition like a theocracy. But it doesn't work, and it will not work. America is not Israel under a king. And there's a man that does not know how to rightly divide the word of truth at all, absolutely. The difference in the old covenant, the new covenant, he doesn't understand. All right, so his disciples said this. Recordings of the sermons by Pastor Roger. Uh, how do you say his name? Yemenez? Okay, Yemenez, is that it? Did I say it right? You think so? All right. I don't really care how you say his name. Roger, uh, surface under the Verity Baptist Church's YouTube account, he said this, are you sad that 50 pedophiles were killed today? He said in the sermon, um, no, I think that's great. I think that helps society. I think Orlando, Florida is a little safer tonight. We don't need to do anything to help. As far as I'm concerned, Orlando is a little bit safer tonight, he said. Somebody responded and said, he's not a man of God. He's not teaching religion. He said, Yemenez's sermon went on to call for even more death at the hands of the government. I said more, more death at the hands of the government. I thought that was interesting, but anyway, um, just the way that was said. If we lived in a righteous government, he said, this is what he says, if we lived in a righteous government, they should round them all up and put them up against a firing wall and blow their brains out. Yemenez said in his sermon. Now see this, how this fits the model for what the LGBT community says Christians believe. This is how Christians really think. This is how they are. And we're so oppressed. We've got to put our ponytails back on and skip, skip back into the closet and be scared. It's not true. That's not what most Christians believe at all. Not even, not even Christians that preach hard against sin. I've never said anything like that before. Luke chapter 9, verse number 52. Turn there, please. Luke chapter 9, verse number 52. 
This is Jesus confronting some things here. And, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Well, what happened here? Well, they said, hey, these people are rejecting you. They're wicked sinners. They're Samaritans. It's time to call down fire from heaven and destroy them. Remember, these apostles, had the, they had the power to do that. They were given power to heal and to do miracles and all stuff. So they said, hey. Should we just call down fire right now and burn them all up and kill them all? No, Jesus said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. He said, I'm not here to do that this time. Like I talked about Sunday, he's coming back again, he's going to do it. But he wasn't here for that. That's not what he was here for. He came to save his people from their sin. So this, this Yemenez guy, he is praising the killing of people. He says he wants the government to do it, but he's really praising vigilante mob rule that took place. Do you understand this? Here's the side. Here's the game that's being played here. You say, well, I like the outcome and the results of it, but I don't agree with the way they did it. No, what you're saying is that's a signal to people to do that. That's a mental game that you're playing, okay? And you're telling people that it's okay to do that. You're, you're sending out a message that this is Christianity, and it's not. It's not biblical Christianity. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. How about Ezekiel thirty-three eleven? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Well, if God doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked, then I suppose I shouldn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked either. Because I'm supposed to be like Christ. But he says, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye for your, from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Right. He's telling them to repent. That's what that word means. Turn. Turn ye. So what does God say to the most vile, wicked people in the world? What is the message that we take to the sodomite community, to the murderers, the drunks, the whoremongers, all of them caught in fornication, wickedness, and sin? What is the message? Repent ye, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. You need to repent and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message. That's the message. Because God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But God would have them repent. Remember Abraham's biblical response? Abraham knew what Sodom was. Do you understand that? Abraham knew what Sodom and Gomorrah was. He knew how wicked it was there. He knew how absolutely wicked it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was interceding for them, trying to, trying to, to spare their lives. Abraham was a righteous man. The Bible says that God imputed righteousness unto him, right? He believed God and it was imputed, it was counted to him for righteousness, right? He was the friend of God. So what did the friend of God do? Did he say, well, go kill them all, Lord. They're a bunch of dirty perverts. Go kill them all. No, that wasn't the response in the Old Testament from Abraham, the friend of God. No, Abraham, the friend of God, what was his response? Oh, Lord, if there be 20 righteous... There'd be 25 righteous. He kept going. He started with it. He kept going down and down and down. Lord, please just save them. So what should our response be? The same. Amen. The same. Amen. That's right. God would have them repent. Why was Abraham trying to save that wicked nation? I mean, it was full of wicked, twisted sodomites. But he pleaded with God not to destroy Sodom. Mm-hmm. He knew what the Lord was going to do to those people and that they would end up in hell 
and he interceded for them. Why? Love. Was he condoning their sin? No, and neither are we. We preach hard against it. But we don't want them to die and go to hell. We don't want them to burn for all of eternity. This comes from a faulty theology. Anderson's theology is a faulty theology. He sounds more like a radical Muslim than a radical Christian. A radical Christian will preach the gospel and believes in the power of the gospel to save lost sinners. I'm going to tell you what. That kid ain't never been saved, and that's what his problem is. Because when you're saved out of a life of sin and wickedness, you understand the power of God to save lost sinners. You get it. You understand that God can change the vilest of sinners because he changed you. But when you don't believe that, when you don't believe in the power of God to change sin, you don't believe in repentance toward God, you don't believe a man can repent, then guess what? It, you, there's no hope for that man. And you're right. Because repentance and faith are gifts of God. And if you don't believe in repentance, well, you're right. There is no hope for that guy. Amen. With your theology, there's none. Islam has no power to change lives, only to chop your head off if you disagree. Yep. And neither does Anderson. He believes the same thing. Right. If you don't conform, you die. Yep. Right? Right? He's preaching a dominionist hybrid theology. Yep. Use the state to enact and force religious laws on the people. Force them to conform. Yep. Yep. That's why many, many of the Puritans did in the standing order did in America. Yep. And that's why they did it to the Baptists too. Yep. So then the LGBT people pick up the narrative and they say, it's hateful and violent statements like these that keep many in the LGB community, LGBT community shut out. Statements like this can cause more harm to our youth and people in the closet. This can cause them to feel worthless. What's he doing? It's play, running the playbook. Right? Running the playbook. He says here, the, the, this uh, homosexual man says, with the LGBT community less than a year removed from a Supreme Court ruling opening the door for marriage equality, Nelson says they've become complacent. But Yemenez's remarks are a reminder the fight for equality isn't over. They don't want equality. They want preference. Look what, look what the sodomite guy says to, about Yemenez. The bottom line is to love thy neighbor as you love thyself. See how he used it? Yeah. See how he twists it? Yeah. See how it plays into the narrative? Do you see how it works? Yeah. Real love is telling the truth, but Anderson's theology gives fuel to the sodomites to come after us and say, well, some speech is simply too harsh to bear, so we've got to get rid of it and not allow you to speak against sin any longer because, after all, kids will commit suicide. Johnny thinks he's a Jenny, and he can't bear to hear it. That's the game plan. That's the game plan right there. It's to end free speech. Anderson and his crew are the provocators that do it, the catalyst that will push it. Reuben Israel. Reuben Israel over in, in uh, the pickled pig's head on a pole. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> anyway, going out to that event, what was he doing? Provocateur what that is what else do you call it they got to push the first amendment they got to push the limits of the first amendment so finally the outrage becomes greater than the outcry okay pastor stephen anderson whose hate knows no bounds says this article celebrated the deaths of 50 people at a gay nightclub in orlando in a four-minute mini sermon that cited the bible as justification for why they needed to die did you see, cited the Bible. Do you see how he said that? And if it didn't happen via a shooter, it should have happened by way of government execution. So it's the most disturbing, hateful response to a mass shooting you'll ever hear. And it was provoked by Anderson's complete hatred of the LGBT people. This is not a Christian response. By the way, it's an Islamic one. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to say that this is an Islamic response. Yeah. It may be a Catholic in the Dark Ages response, but it's not a Christian response. Okay? See, a lot of these jokers don't know their history, but I know the history, and I understand how this, I, I understand 
who these people are and what they stand for. For instance, are we going to force people with the state to not be atheists and when they're when we put then we put them to death after all it says thou shalt have no other gods before me. So do we start putting people to death for what they believe? Yep. Think about it. Baptist no, Baptist never did that. That's right. And Jesus said, let them alone, right? The wheat and the tares? Think about it. If someone harms, rapes, and murders, and other things like that, then yes, they have to answer for their wrongdoing, raping children and such. But we don't charge people with a crime we think they will commit. Anderson says they're all pedophiles. Well, I would agree they are all prone to be, but you can't prove that they are. All are. It's a little hard. I've made that statement before because I believe most of them are or can be or, you know, have a good opportunity to be. Yep. But to enjoy the death of the wicked and rejoice that they're murdered is a wicked theology not found in the New Testament or the New Covenant. Here's what he says. The good news is that there's 50 less pedophiles in this world because, you know, these homosexuals are a bunch of disgusting perverts and pedophiles. That's who was a victim here. Are a, bunch, are a bunch of just disgusting homosexuals at a gay bar, okay? But the bad news is that this is now going to be used, and I'm sure to push for gun control, where you know law-abiding normal Americans are not going to be allowed to have guns for self-defense. And then I'm sure it's also going to be used to push an agenda against so-called hate speech. So Bible-believing Christian preachers who preach what the Bible actually says about homosexuality, that it's vile, that it's disgusting, that they're reprobates, you know, we're going to be blamed like it's all extremism. It's not just the Muslims, it's the Christians. I'm sure that that's coming. I'm sure that people are going to start attacking, you know, Bible-believing Christians now because of what this guy did. No, I think they're going to attack him from what you just said. But I think you knew that already. He says, now let me, be, let me just be real clear. I've never advocated for violence. <laughs> I don't believe in, you know, taking the law into our own hands. I would never go in and shoot up a gay bar, so-called. I don't believe it's right for us just to be vigilante. But I will say this. The Bible says that homosexuals should be put to death in Leviticus 20.13. Obviously, it's not right for somebody to just, you know, shoot up the place because that's not gonna, go, going through the proper channels. But these people all should have been killed anyway. But they should have been killed through the proper channels, as in they should have been executed by a righteous government that would have tried them, convicted them, and saw them executed. Because in Leviticus 20, 13, God's perfect law, he put the death penalty on murder, and he also put the death penalty on homosexuality. That's what the Bible says, plain and simple. So you know the good news is that at least 50 of these pedophiles are not going to be harming children anymore. The bad news is that a lot of the homos in the bar are still alive. So they're going to continue to molest children and recruit people into their filthy homosexual lifestyle. I'm not sad about it. I'm not going to cry about it. Because these 50 people in a gay bar that got shot up, they were going to die of AIDS and syphilis and whatever else. They were going to all die early anyway. Because homosexuals have a 20-year shorter lifespan than normal people anyway. As you can see... <laughs> wow. Okay, so that's the end quote. That's, the, that's what he said. Now let me ask you a question. Does that sound like a Christian response to you? Does that sound like a biblical response? I'm all for preaching hard against sin, and I know it's wicked, and you just heard me say, and I've got a whole series on sodomites and sodomites in the land, and I've preached hard against it, but I've never once rejoiced in the death of somebody or tried to rejoice in the death of somebody. That's nothing but agent provocator type behavior is all that is. That's exactly what it is. It's done for a reason. It's done for, because he fits the narrative. He fits the story. He fits the, he fits the antagonist. He fits the playbook. That's what it's about. I'm telling you. It's plain as day. That's what it is. He asked me one time, because I was on, I, he asked me one time on, on Facebook if I thought that he was a, <laughs> a CIA agent. He did ask me. I'm pretty sure I told him, yeah, I think you're a stinking plant. I think you work with Alex Jones. I think you work with a lot of guys. I think you're a plant. What's that? No, he never responded to me again. Blocked me, too.
It got a little weird for a while. Mm -mm. Mixed message from a messed up theology right there, right? As you can see, he says he's not for the way it was done, but he praises the outcome, right? He was praising the outcome. And then if you couple in his marching to Dearborn free Palestine t-shirts that he did, when he's mar you don't some of you don't know what that is, but he marched to Dearborn, okay, and he did a soul winning convention type thing out there. And when he was out there, he had these shirts about free Palestine, and he tried to say that marching to Zion translated into what was that? The Jews and their lies. He said, Well, that's Hebrew. It's <laughs> translated from Hebrew. It's a transliteration of this of this exact phrase in Aramaic. No, it's not. Where do you get, how do you get marching to Zion to the Jews and their lies? You filthy provocateur. You're just rotten. But that's what, now why? Why would he do that? Because he's part of the plan. And it's weird in his, how he linked Muslims and Christians together, too, in what he was saying. I'm sorry, but people need to understand, there's people that listen to him. There's people in here that used to listen to him. The guy's, the guy's wicked. But all of it makes sense. It's a man that with a messed up theology and an agent provocateur. What's the goal? To be part of the game, to play part of the game. That's what it is, and to hurt the cause of Christ. I don't care how many people he runs through a prayer out there. He's playing a game. It's a classic Jesuit playbook. Next, ISIS sees it as an opportunity. That's the next opportunist, ISIS. Why is that? Well, whoever ISIS is, whether they're an entity of Hillary Clinton and the CIA, right, which they are, an entity of the federal government, that's why the federal government got mad when Putin bombed ISIS. <laughs> they got angry because Putin bombed ISIS. Well, why would you get mad if they bombed your enemy? You'd think you'd be happy. Oh, well, it cost you a lot of money, didn't it? That's why. Okay, that makes sense. And now it's going to show this, the great Satan. America's the great Satan. So what does that do? It pushes. You don't have to get these Islamic extremists, because they are out there. Be, besides what anybody believes about the narrative, it is true. There are some out there. There are many out there, and they do hate America. Okay? But you don't have to do too much to pump those guys up, to get them excited to, to do the things that they're doing. You don't have to do a whole lot. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. It's used to pump up other terrorists or Muslims to come and attack with copycat killings. Because after all, that America is wicked. So they recruit against America. Others who would want to bring America down to the same thing. Never mind the Islamic nations that oppress them. And without Christianity, there would be no advance of a nation that all these, these people would even come to. Do you understand? If it wasn't for America... If it wasn't for Christianity, we wouldn't have this nation today. If it wasn't for Christianity, they'd have nowhere to go. But they're lost, wicked heathens, devil-possessed. Now, there's also something else that you have to understand in this. Albert Pike had his prophecy that he wrote about, uh, about the Third World War. All right? And... His prediction, I'm not going to read it to you, but his prediction basically was that they would foment a third world war and it would be basically Islam versus Christianity versus the world, basically. And his scenario was that Islam would basically rise and there'd be a Zionist type of a fight between, between the two and that they would rise, that Islam would rise up to take over, but these minorities that would rise up would be crushed. Right? So what's going on in America today? They're trying to foment anger with Christians, with just American males, basically. Any that are left. Right? Right. White America. That's, that's another thing. That's another goal they have is to push white Americans to desperation so they will get angry, so they will become racist, so they will just say, okay, let's kill them all. Because what are you mostly people that want to do that? They're mostly what? They're white Americans. Black, and then you have Black Lives Matter. 
What's, how do they fit into the scale? Thing? A race war. That's what it's about. It's about pitting races against each other. So we can have an all-out onslaught and war. Right, so they can come in and say, well, it's the religious extremists, and we're going to fix that with atheism and everything else, and the rise of the Antichrist kingdom. A man will sweep in, and he'll take care of it all. That's the game plan. That's part of the plan. That's what they want to do. And also, yeah, exactly. But Islam, it, Albert Pike said a long ago that this war would take place, that there would be this war that would happen. Some say a Jesuit wrote it. Some say he wrote it. Either way, exactly what he said is what's happening. What's that? Yeah, all three of them. He predicted World War I, World War II, and World War III. And the, the game plan was all the same all the way through. I mean, not the same, but is exactly what he said is exactly what happened. Why is that? Because it was a plan from the New World Order. I don't know why people don't have a hard time believing that Satan can control things. Like God has a kingdom, Christ has a kingdom, right? Christ has followers, and Satan has high-level Luciferian followers, that they're all Luciferian at the top. They're all part of the lodge at the top. They're all part of the, they're all, they're, they all serve Lucifer. That's what he's, Albert Pike said. Albert Pike said that's what would happen, that they would all be ready for Lucifer to come to fix everything. Right, the Luciferian doctrine, that's right. They would all be ready for Lucifer, that, that light bearer, right, that he called them, to sweep in, and they will all serve Lucifer. Even the, and he mentions the, the atheists and the agnostics, they will worship Lucifer. Right. They'll be the first ones to do it. Yep, that's the game plan. That's the, that's the game plan to bring in, to bring in chaos. So they can create what? Order out of chaos. Right? It's a big satanic plan, and all the players are fitting into it nicely. Hey, can I ask you a question? Name one nation Islam has ever made better. Anybody, can anybody name one? They've ruined everything. They destroy everything. Why? Because it's Satan's theology. That's why. And the Vatican's. <laughs> Roman Catholicism made America worse. So understand, and then you can go back and listen to the sermon, Rome is the mom of Islam. Go listen to that if you haven't heard that one. Have you heard that one, Brother Jacob? Did you like that title? Uh -huh. Huh, yeah, that was a good one. Did you, did you listen to that one yet? Rome is the mom of Islam, you did? That's great. Brother Finney, have you listened to that one? All right, I'm just checking to see if you have. You're looking at me kind of funny, so I wasn't for sure if you had. Oh, no. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are you saying you always look funny like that or what? <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> You know why Islam can't work? Because the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Islam is not compatible with the U.S. Constitution. It will never, never could be. It can't be. Yeah, or Catholicism. Neither one of them. Right? They can't be. All right, so that's, anyway, that's in ISIS. Obviously, ISIS is an entity of the federal government, I believe. And uh, I believe that's all part of the game. There's a whole history of that. It's not hard to find. If you just study this, it's not hard to find. It's not even propaganda. It's pretty much like just stated fact. It's just most people don't care about it anymore because they're too busy watching pornography, having their minds entertained to death, watching sports, seeing who's winning the NBA championships. Meanwhile, everything around them is going to hell because they, be, they can't be serious about anything. And there's just no, yeah, video games, there's just no sober-mindedness anymore among people. So you can't have a serious com conversation with them. All right, next, Donald Trump sees it as an opportunity. You know, this event is also going to be used by Donald Trump to push a right-wing fascist war hawk agenda. Now, who knows? They could change anything they want to and control this and change this. By the way, the elections are rigged anyway, just in case you didn't know that. I'll just ruin it for you. I'll go to the end of the story. The presidential elections are rigged already. They already know the players. 
They already said, hey, when you choose the two players, who, who cares which one gets in? You've already chosen them. You were already told that Donald Trump and, and Hillary was going to be the nominees before any. I mean, you already told that. Yeah, you already just told that. So the, it's already rigged. It's already a setup. And they're both being used by that. But what's going on here? I told you guys a year ago what was happening, that they would set, they were going to set up Obama as this weak leader that doesn't handle terrorism, doesn't handle things, and they, that what would ride in would be this right-wing fascist dictator, psycho, crazy war hawk that would come in. I told you that a year ago, that they would bring this guy in, and he was going to be like, you know, he's going to kill the moose lambs. Right? Yeah. He's going to slaughter the moose lambs and put down all the opposition and put a fence up on the border to lock you in, I mean, to keep them out. Right? Yeah, I mean, I agree with some of the, but see, here's the problem with these people. Some of the, what they say is true. Yeah, we do need to stop illegal immigration. It's awful. But we're the ones pushing it. We're the ones doing it. But we know why we're doing it. Uh, Alberto, uh, the ex-Jesuit Alberto wrote about this back in 1975 or 85, somewhere around there before he was killed um, by Jesuits. Um, he wrote about the fact that the Pope would use the Mexican border to pour people over the Mexican border for the Pope to fill this land up, yeah, Catholics, to fill this land up and to change the whole dynamic of the nation. And he was right. It happened. Anyway. <clears throat> but Trump fits the agenda. He fits it too. By the way, for people to think that Trump is not co-opted, I mean, what university did he go to? Fordham University. Does anybody know what Fordham University is? It's a Jesuit university. But he's, he's an outsider. And he sent his kids to Georgetown, which is another... Jesuit University. Um, two Corinthians is the whole ball game, though. <laughs> right? Two Corinthians is the whole ball game right there. It's it. It's everything. It's the whole ball game. And he's an outsider, right? And he's not controlled by the banks. Hello, the banks own all of his real estate. He's bankrupted two or three different times and all those other things, and you think that he's not owned? Of course he's owned. Come on. Anyway, Trump fits, he fits right into it. He's part of it. He's not an outsider. I don't know how anybody could ever think he's an outsider. He's just a New Yorker. He just has a big mouth. What? It's true. He's just a New Yorker with a big mouth, and people are tired of the limp-wristed leadership we've had for years, so you just put in an angry white dude from New York that speaks his mind and doesn't care what anybody thinks. And what happens? Everybody will like him. Say, so, well, he's an outsider. That's why Alex Jones is no. It's a classic Jesuit plan. It's all it's all a game. That's what it is. These people are all players in a game. The minute you understand that, the easier life will be. And you can get back to the gospel and get back to preaching the Bible and understand that these people are all they're all bought and paid for actors. That's what they are. They're already paid for. I mean, come on. You're going to do what you're told when you're in leadership like that, or you're going to be dead. They'll get rid of who they want to get rid of. It's just true. In broad daylight, in front of everybody, right. Like they did, like Reagan didn't play along with it. Anyway, I'm getting too spooky on you. You better keep going now. I better keep going. Anyway. Yeah, he did. Well, he couldn't help it. I mean, George Bush was like two, two steps away from him the whole time. The guy was scary. Anyway, this is to build that rage up so men will vote for Donald Trump, vote and get him in, stop the border. So, and it's just a foment a race war, and that's what's happening. Black Lives Matter, they're, they're fomenting a race war. That's what they're doing. They've been doing it, and that's what they're going to do. That's what they want. They want us to fight each other because you, if you fight each other, you won't fight them. If you stop playing their games, their satanically led games, right? I saw that. I, I, 
I saw that it was sent that somebody hacked into Black Lives Matters, I guess, and and um, yeah, the leaders account and found out that they're just fomenting a race war. They're gonna they're gonna foment all this stuff around Donald Trump's play. That's why they're setting all this stuff up. You think this isn't? I mean, come on, it's not an accident. Yeah, it's a grassroots movement. Sure, it is. Isn't it ran by two lesbian women? I heard it was. I thought that Black Lives... What's that? You know one of them. How do you know them? Oh, I thought you said you knew him. I'm like, wait a minute. We've got to have a different conversation here. <laughs> Nate, Andrew, grab him. <laughs> Don't let him leave. <laughs> yeah. That's where the big rallies are taking place, and they're standing outside. What is that? It's a plan. Listen, you say, Preacher, why do you got to talk about all this stuff? Because it's real, and it's happening. And God said that this devil's kingdom would arise, and that this fourth kingdom would come, and that all this destruction would happen, and not to be deceived, and not to let your heart fail you with fear because of what's going to come, because it is going to come. We can't think that that's the last attack that's going to take place or that these things are the end of it. No, it's the beginning of it. Right, and nobody's telling people that, hey, these guys are a bunch of shills. Will you stop believing them? Stop listening to those stupid commentators on Fox News. Stop listening to Alex Jones. Get in your Bible and get a biblical perspective and understanding of things. Amen. And don't listen to blowhards like Stephen Anderson who don't know what they're talking about who want to foment a war. They want a war. That's what they want. They've, they've basically made America so it's all cut up and, and, and separated. Why do we do that? Because if we separate everybody along these, these lines and we keep them all separate, I'm not talking about diversity of thought. I'm just talking about we get them all in their separate little groups, then we can take over easier. Because we run all of the groups. And what happens when you're a radical guy that don't fit into any of their groups? You get killed. Or you get watched. Because it's all a game. It's all a game. I know this isn't a conventional message. I understand that. I didn't mean it to be either. It's just to inform, it's to inform you of some things so you understand what's really going on. This is not speculation. This is fact. These things are happening now. And they're not going to stop happening. Yeah, that's right. It is over for America. You're seeing the downfall of this nation. Because they turned their back on God. Because the churches in America turned their back on God. For many reasons. They wanted the state to run them, so the state's going to destroy them. So what's the biblical response to this? What is our biblical response to be to this? Well, listen, number one, Jesus is always the answer. Jesus, the gospel is the answer. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So for, for, for the homosexuals, what do you tell them? You better repent and believe the gospel. You need to be saved. I'm not going to change my message for you to make you feel good. You need to repent and believe the gospel before you die and go to hell. That's for any sinner, fornicator, liar, cheat, stealer, thief, whatever the case may be. They're all sinners before God and exceedingly sinful. But the answer is to go to sodomites is to preach the gospel to them and call them to repentance. They need to be born again. And we should never jump for joy seeing sinners murdered. These are people that are in hell now. How could anybody be happy about somebody being in hell? It shouldn't excite us to see people thrown in hell. We should never forget their, their plight. We should never lose sight of their plight. Never lose sight of the fact that these people are lost and dying in their sins, deceived by Satan. Yes, they're vile and disgusting, and such as were some of you. Amen. Amen. God says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they would repent. But Anderson, he doesn't believe in repentance, so he has to handle it in the flesh. Kill them all is his answer because they can't be saved in his mind. But we must believe in the power of the gospel to save lost sinners, and we've got to pray. 
Folks, we've got to pray. We've got to give ourselves over to prayer in our homes, in our church, and everywhere we go. We need to be praying. Praying for opportunities to shine the true light. Because you know what? People like that control. They get to control the narrative. They get to control everything. And they're, they're, the, the falsehoods gets out there so everybody can see it. So everybody believes the lies. They never, they never know the truth of Christianity, the truth of biblical repentance, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ changing sinners' lives. We have to keep preaching everywhere and practice that free speech in the form of preaching everywhere. We can't back off. Cooling off and backing off will make things worse. And you know what? We need to practice what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 43. You've heard. Turn there, please. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 43. We're almost done here. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? The Bible says that we're to love our enemies, not seek revenge upon them. Not seek vengeance upon them. And see, that's, what, that's the difference in the message of Christ and the message of Islam and the message of Anderson. Oh, yeah, I'm glad those filthy sodomites were killed there. That's awful. That's an awful message to give people. And for a Christian to say that, how awful is that to tell people that you're, you're glad they died? Why do you feel that way about them? Why not about the fornicator? I mean, some of them believe that too, but somebody that fornicated, okay, well, they deserve to die. Well, I hate to break it to you. We all deserve to die. We all deserve to die. Every single one of us deserve death and hell. I'm glad I don't get what I deserve. Amen. You just think about that. You know, that's the message that you love your enemies. You know, I don't, I, when we go out and preach to people, they may think we hate We don't hate you. We want you to be saved. But we're going to tell you the truth. And all these players are a bunch of opportunists. They're all playing their part for Satan. This world is ran by Antichrist. This is an Antichrist world that is ran by Satan. And the Bible says and foretold that this time would come, and we are seeing it rapidly. We're seeing changes in this nation that we've never seen before. Since I was a child, I've never seen anything like this. Because evil is rising. And we have to shine the light. And you know what? Because of the rise of evil, the light is going to shine bright, and it's going to hurt. A lot of people, when they, when, when they feel it and they see it, they're not going to like it. Because it's dark. Why do you think people take such a, they, they just don't know how to handle the fact that you abstain from all appearance of evil. You, you, other Christians, that you're away from Hollywood, you're away from movies, you're away from music, you're away from the entertainment of the world and all those things. Why do you think it's hard for them to take that? Because it's so dark now. It's so absolutely dark now. That just a little bit of light shining, that little bit of that separation and people can't handle it because they're not used to seeing it because it's getting dark. So we need to pray. We need to do what we can do. We need to pray. We need to preach. We need to tell the truth and let the truth be known out there. Don't let people like Anderson, people like that, take over the discussion. You know, you have to be out there about your father's business and bringing in the truth because all these people are setting up for Satan's kingdom. That's what the plan is. And you know what? Take heart, though, because Christ foretold that it would come. And we know, and we've read the end, we win. Amen? So they may take the body, but they can't take the soul. Amen. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your words. And Lord, uh, thank you just for understanding and clarity of different things that go on. 
in this life, Lord, what our perspective, our, our understanding and our actions should be towards them, Lord. And we shouldn't hate anybody to the point of wanting to see them die and wanting to see them burn in hell or rejoice in somebody getting their brains blowed out, Lord. That's awful. And, Lord, I just pray that nobody would accept that as being right, that we would stand against those things and tell those people that, you know what, we hate your sin and God hates your sin and you're going to die and go to hell for your sin and you have to repent. But we don't want to see you die. We don't want to see you go to hell. That's why we're warning you to flee from the wrath to come. Dear God, help us to be a light to those out there in darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.